Welcome to this edition's Nobel Dialogue, a series where we talk to Nobel laureates about their scientific experience, career path, as well as the groundbreaking discoveries that they were awarded the Nobel Prize for. Today, it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. William Kalin, the 2019 Nobel Prize recipient in medicine or physiology. Dr. Kalin was awarded the 2019 Nobel Prize jointly with Dr. Greg Semenza and Sir Peter Radcliffe for discovering how cells sense oxygen and oxygen availability. More specifically, Dr. Kalin and his laboratory used the genetic disorder called von Hippel-Lindau disease, which is a disorder characterized by the growth of tumors in various organs to study this phenomenon. Dr. Kalin received his MD from Duke University in 1982, and then later on became a medical oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He was also a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Dr. David Livingston, where he began his studies of tumor suppressor proteins. He became an independent investigator at Dana-Farber in 1992, and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School in 2002. It is a great honor and pleasure to, doc to welcome Dr. William Kalin, and please enjoy the interview. Thank you very much for joining us in this edition's Nobel Dialogue. My pleasure. Um, so we can start, start with the questions and dig in um, in the scientific uh, part of, the, um, um, of your career. So can you maybe tell us why specifically have you focused on von Hippel-Lindau disease? I mean, were you interested in, in, in trying to solve the pathophysiology of it or maybe use the disease as a model to, to explore something broader? Well, there were several reasons why we decided to work on uh, von Hippel-Lindau disease. I had worked on a relatively famous tumor suppressor gene, the RB gene as a postdoc. And I started my own laboratory in 1992 when I was sort of looking for something to work on. And fortunately, the paper describing the BHL tumor suppressor gene crossed my desk. And so I thought some of the things I had learned in the course of studying the RB gene might be helpful as I tackled yet another tumor suppressor gene. But more importantly, I knew from my clinical training that uh, the tumors seen in BHL disease, uh, we're trying to teach us something. So first of all, I should step back and say that I knew that one of the tumors that is seen in BHL disease is kidney cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, and kidney cancer is one of the 10 most common cancers in the developed world. So I thought everything else being equal, why not work on a common cancer as opposed to a, an uncommon cancer? So one motivation was that by studying the BHL gene, we might learn something about the pathophysiology of a relatively common uh, cancer. Uh, and I assumed, and it was quickly proven uh, by others, that the same gene is mutated in sporadic or non-hereditary kidney cancer. Uh, and so it seemed like this was a good opportunity to learn something about kidney cancer. Mm -hmm. But I also knew from my clinical training that the tumors seen in VHL disease are highly angiogenic, very rich in blood vessels. And there was great interest in the 90s, partly because of the work of Judah Folkman, in trying to treat cancers by blocking angiogenesis. So I thought if we studied the BHL gene, we might learn something about the molecular control of angiogenesis. And that might eventually, with luck, lead to better uh, therapies aimed at blocking angiogenesis. And then finally, I knew that in addition to being rich in blood vessels, these tumors also sometimes cause patients to make too many red blood cells. And what angiogenesis and erythropoiesis have in common is that they're normally induced or can be induced when cells or tissues are not getting enough oxygen. So my, my final sort of leap of faith was that studying the BHL gene, we might eventually learn how cells sensed and responded to changes in oxygen. And fortunately, that turned out to be a pretty good hunch. Yeah, a very, very, very good hunch. And can, can you maybe tell us uh, what was the biggest challenge during your um, research on, on VHL? Were there maybe some points during the research that you thought that maybe you should abandon this topic because you got some conflicting results or some technical difficulties or something else? Yeah, so there were a couple that come to mind. First of all, I mentioned uh, a second ago the uh, cloning of the von Hippel-Lindau uh, tumor suppressor gene, which was done by others. Mm -hmm. But in, in their paper, they reported that the message would be 
a little over 6 KB. And they reported that their, the open reading frame they had identified, had identified was open at the five prime end of the cDNA. And so it was assumed that they had actually isolated a partial uh, cDNA. So we actually spent about a year trying to get the full length mm -hmm. cDNA, again, with the assumption that uh, the existing cDNA was partial. Uh, now, we, we actually pulled out many, many uh, VHL cDNAs doing this the old fashioned way. At the time, this was done by uh, doing hybridization and phage uh, lifts. Uh, but we never could get a cDNA bigger than about 4 KB. And in mm -hmm. fact, none of our cDNAs even went as far to the five prime end as did the published VHL cDNA. Mm -hmm. We really didn't know what the problem was. Uh, fortunately, we had already embarked upon making antibodies to the VHL protein using the predicted C terminus of the VHL protein. And with those antibodies in hand, we could see that actually the protein made in mammalian cells was actually quite small and actually could be encoded by the entire published cDNA. And then we finally did what we should have done day one, which was to do our own northern blot to see how long the message truly was. And it turned mm -hmm. out the message was much closer to 4 KB, which explained why we never saw a message longer than about 4 KB. Uh, and mm -hmm. then finally, uh, after I called the investigators who described or reported the cDNA, they admitted that they were so sure they were missing some of the five prime mm -hmm. sequence that in silico, they had added some genomic sequence to the cDNA sequence. But of course that was mm -hmm. a non natural yeah. <laughs> event. And that explained why we never got into what they were calling the theoretical five prime end. Mm -hmm. the so that was one uh, sort of roadblock. And then well, once we mm -hmm. realized we had the entire open reading frame, we were ready to start working. Uh, another roadblock occurred later when we discovered or uh, that the VHL protein indeed regulates the abundance of so-called hypoxia-inducible mRNAs, including, for example, the mRNA encoding by Jeff, and mm -hmm. the link between VHL and angiogenesis. But I must say our initial studies and the studies of others suggested that the VHL protein primarily regulated the stability of these mRNAs and not the transcription of these mRNAs. And so for that and other reasons, we were thinking VHL probably would be regulating an RNA binding protein that regulated mRNA turnover rather than a transcription factor. Mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, HIP was such an attractive target. We did look in our kidney cancer cell lines that did or did not have an intact version of the VHL protein. And we simply couldn't see HIP-1 alpha with the available antibodies. And so we took that as even mm -hmm. further evidence that all the action would be at the level of mRNA turnover. Uh, but mm -hmm. fortunately, I ran into Patrick Maxwell at a meeting in Paris circa 1998, 1999. And he told me that uh, uh, his laboratory, and at the time he was working for Sir Peter Redcliffe, had made mm -hmm. antibodies to HIF-2, which was the less studied member of the family. And they could see that, first of all, in the lines we were working up with, uh, indeed the cells didn't express HIF-1, but they did express HIF-2. And you could see that HIF-2 was deregulated in the absence of VHL. And then they surveyed other cell lines that did express both HIF-1 and HIF-2, and they could see that VHL regulated them both. So. Uh, th that was the second time I think we sort of got bumped off the trail a little bit, but thankfully, mm -hmm. thanks to that chance meeting with Patrick Maxwell, we got back on the trail. Yeah, and, and you mentioned that, that you basically um, um, consulted with, with other researchers, but, but have you maybe um, um, done anything with, with Dr. Semenza and Dr. Radcliffe while you were doing your research? Maybe have you three collaborated uh, closely on these findings because all three of you were working within yes. the, the same field. Yes. So mm -hmm. I, I was certainly aware of uh, Greg Semenza's earlier work characterizing HIF, uh, but really we didn't collaborate. And uh, when we started to get into the heart of the oxygen sensing mechanism, uh, mm -hmm. he, he had kind of gone in other directions. So we weren't working together. 
uh, and we weren't basing anything we did on, on his uh, work at that time. In contrast, as I just mentioned to you, uh, once uh, I learned of the work of Peter Radcliffe that BHL regulated uh, both HIP2 and HIP1, uh, we had already done a fair amount of work that suggested that the BHL protein was part of a ubiquitin ligase complex. And so we were able to very quickly show that indeed the VHL protein as part of a ubiquitin ligase binds directly to HIP1 mm -hmm. alpha and HIP2 alpha and uh, directly uh, then attaches a poly ubiquitin chain, which serves as a signal for HIP1 alpha and HIP2 alpha to be degraded by the proteasome. Uh, and uh, I think within a matter of months, uh, the Radcliffe group published similar uh, findings. And at, at this point, it was clear to my lab and to Peter's lab, the big question was, how does this get regulated by oxygen? And so uh, we didn't collaborate. We decided it would be best if we worked independently, but we also made, sort of made a, a gentleman's agreement that mm -hmm. if, we got, if we got to the answer about the same time, we would try to coordinate public, you know, pu the publications mm -hmm. and have the publications appear back to back. And that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and for the core part of, of your research, can you maybe give us a perspective how long um, it took for, for your lab um, uh, to make these um, discoveries roughly? Even with these bumps you had. Um, yeah, so um, even with the, the bumps, so I would say we started yeah. working on 1993. Mm -hmm. uh, by 95, we reported that the full length BHL cDNA when uh, reintroduced into kidney cancer cell lines that carried BHL mutations would suppress their ability to form tumors in new mm -hmm. mice. So that sort of credentialed it as a professional tumor suppressor. In 1996, mm -hmm. we reported that cells lacking the BHL protein are unable to sense oxygen as we had sort of hypothesized based on the clinical features of the disease. And so that was very uh, rewarding. From 95 to 98, we, showed, we did biochemical studies showing that the BHL protein associates with other proteins and almost certainly forms the ubiquitin ligase complex mm -hmm. as a result, which is why, again, we were in a very good position when in 1999, uh, Maxwell and Radcliffe reported that cells lacking the BHL protein can't degrade HIF-1 alpha and HIF-2 alpha. Uh, uh, so by the year 2000, we showed uh, unequivocally, again, that VHL really was the ubiquitin ligase for HIF-1 alpha mm -hmm. and HIF-2 alpha. And then it was in 2001 that we published that the, the, the oxygen-dependent signal that was key to the oxygen sensing mechanism was prolyl hydroxylation of, of the HIF-alpha mm -hmm. subunit. So really, I would mm -hmm. say from 93 to 2001 uh, got us mm -hmm. to the point where we had done the work that eventually led to the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. uh, for the next five years, we did a number of studies that I think really focused on the role of HIF2, particularly in driving these, the, the formation of these kidney cancers. And that helped uh, eventually lead to new drugs for the treatment of kidney cancer. Mm -hmm. so, so roughly for the core part, around seven, eight years, yes, correct. more or less. Yes. And, and do you think lo looking from, from like today, to, to that period, do you think that that if you had something and and what would that be it would help the uh, accelerate the research? So, you know, cut the time from let's say eight years to maybe five years. So I already mentioned we spent a, a year trying to get the full length VHL cDNA uh, using uh, methods that uh, were were appropriate at the time, but now would be considered. Uh, very, very uh, crude. Uh, and in mm -hmm. fact, of course, now we have the benefit of uh, the human uh, genome. Uh, uh, we have the ability to synthesize entire uh, cDNAs. Uh, so uh, probably uh, we could, maybe you could have shaved a year if it would have been e e much easier at the time to sort of authenticate uh, the correct uh, cDNA. Uh, but I would say the other steps uh, I'm not sure it would have been wildly uh, accelerated. It's true mm. uh, now uh, with some of the experiments we did, uh, I could possibly do them a little bit faster using, for example, CRISPR-based uh, mm -hmm. editing, uh, but things actually went pretty fast. I can't complain. Yeah, yeah. I mean, since, since you already mentioned gene editing, 
Um, do you see that that potential of gene editing in, in maybe your cancer field um, um, in the future, in the clinic specifically? And, and I mean, do you see it as an ethical approach in, in humans? Well, first of all, I don't think the ethical concerns are nearly as profound if you're editing uh, somatic cells as opposed to mm -hmm. uh, uh, editing the germline. And I think the initial applications in cancer are going to be, for example, in cellular therapy, uh, re-engineering T cells to make them more effective cancer mm -hmm. fighters or making them uh, more resistant to uh, host versus graft, sort of rejection uh, phenomenon. Uh, and then in time, uh, there may be other applications, maybe to make uh, bone marrow more resistant to uh, chemotherapy, uh, Perhaps there'll be other clever approaches to make people be able to withstand cancer therapy better. Uh, and eventually, uh, there, there's, there's no reason, at least in principle, you couldn't start to do gene editing on the cancer cells uh, themselves. Uh, but if we're gonna start to correct some of the genetic mutations that gave rise to those cancers in the first place, the editing will have to be extremely efficient or you'll just keep selecting for the cells where editing had not uh, occurred. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think it's it's coming. As I said, I think the first applications will be in cellular cellular therapies using uh, T cells that have been modified by CRISPR to make them better cancer fighters. Yeah, and and already there are experimental drugs, um, um, HIF hydroxylase inhibitors, um, such as those that are used in the treatment of anemia, for example, in, in chronic kidney disease. And and do you maybe see any other drugs targeting HIF uh, being used in the clinic relatively? Um, soon and for, for, for which diseases? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm happy to report that the first HIF2 inhibitor was approved mm -hmm. for treatment of von Hippel-Lindau disease in August. Uh, that's a drug mm -hmm. called Sudafan uh, that's currently being developed by Merck. And I should declare I have a small financial interest in mm -hmm. Belsudafan. And Belsudafan is also in phase three trials now for the treatment of kidney cancer. So hopefully in time, it'll be useful for non-hereditary uh, kidney cancers, not just mm -hmm. treatment of uh, the tumors seen in the context of, uh, or, or occurring in the context of VHL disease. And then on the, on the flip side, HIF stabilizers, we think may be useful for the treatment of anemia and maybe in time heart attack and stroke. And uh, the first of these to be approved uh, is a drug called Roxadustat, uh, mm -hmm. approved now in many co countries around uh, the world for the treatment of anemia in the setting of chronic uh, kidney disease. Uh, it was not, uh, however, approved in the United States, or at least not yet. It may be that they need to do additional uh, clinical trials. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully, I mean, hopefully those drugs will come um, in the clinic and benefit um, patients um, long term. And and you won the Nobel Prize two years ago in, in, in 20, almost three years ago now in 20, 19, um, but do you maybe have any thoughts about uh, which breakthroughs in the biomedical field are deserving of the uh, Nobel Prize, but maybe have not won it? Yeah, uh, before I answer that, maybe you can spice mm -hmm. this in. I should also declare that I have a financial conflict of interest with Broxadustat. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm following it with uh, interest, but people should be aware that I have a financial conflict mm -hmm. of interest. Uh, so the question was other things that might be worthy of a Nobel Right. Yes, yes. Well, uh, you know, one thing that's clear with prizes is, first of all, it's been said by many that uh, the Nobel Prize and prizes like it say as much about the discovery as the discoverer, uh, mm. which uh, is certainly uh, true. Uh, and secondly, this does become a little bit of a beauty contest because sometimes this is in the eye of the beholder, which is why I always warn students that, you know, don't get overly preoccupied with uh, prizes. I mean, the real prize mm -hmm. for us was first of all, participating in the discovery process and having the joy of understanding uh, something that hadn't been understood before, especially when it turned out to be beautiful and elegant. But again, that was a tribute to nature. That wasn't a tribute mm -hmm. to us. And then we also have had the satisfaction of seeing that information built upon uh, to the point where, again, now we can start to see new therapies being developed. So I think those are the real prizes. Uh, but anyway, yeah. to, try to, to try to answer your question, uh, I think it's only a matter of time before uh, there is a, a Nobel Prize for the uh, breakthroughs that eventually enabled the mRNA-based uh, vaccines. Mm -hmm. 
that we're all talking about. Uh, I've thought for some time that there should be uh, a prize related to uh, epigenetics and specifically the biochemistry related to histone modifications and mm -hmm. nuclear, uh, uh, topology, how, how that all influences uh, gene uh, regulation. So I can imagine a prize uh, there. Uh, I, I, I also think the early work that showed us that kinases could be inhibited with small molecule drugs at a time when that was actually considered pretty heretical that maybe that work should be recognized uh, with the Nobel Prize since it begets so many important uh, drugs, at least in the cancer field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, there, there are like so many, so many discoveries made, um, um, but, but only some can actually win the, um, the Nobel Prize. Um, and I was wondering, uh, what are your thoughts on, on open access science in general? Are you for it, against it, partially for it, partially against it? Well, initially, I was a little concerned that even with uh, peer review, a number of things mm -hmm. get published that turn out to be not reproducible or robust. So I, I was a little concerned about open access, at least open access uh, in a way that completely circumvents uh, peer review. But I, 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 mm -hmm. I, I tend to think the positives outweigh uh, the negative. Certainly, we want to have information available to people. And I think there are a lot of ways to deal with the peer review uh, question. And so I think I'm, I'm certainly more for than against. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in today's world, uh, we live basically um, still in, in a COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And, and many people still kind of don't believe in, 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 unfortunately, the science. Science, so what do you think are the main challenges facing science today and potentially in the near, near future? And do you have any maybe proposals how to try to uh, solve these uh, challenges? Well, there are a couple of layers to your question. I, I think mm -hmm. so. you're talking, first of all, about uh, science and the role it plays in society. And so mm -hmm. I think we have to really look at how we teach scientific literacy to uh, people in school. Uh, we have to go back to uh, teaching them about logic and reasoning and evidence and data. And hopefully we can sort of raise everyone's scientific uh, literacy so they'll be less susceptible to sort of quacks and conspiracy, mm -hmm. conspiracy theorists, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then at another level, I think in terms of uh, the role science plays, I think all scientists have to realize that they, uh, it's, it's in our collective best interest for them to become good communicators and good advocates. Mm -hmm. for, 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 for science. And so I think all of us can probably do a better job. Now I'm talking about all of us scientists can probably do a better job of articulating uh, what we do to mm -hmm. play uh, public. Uh, I'm hoping now that I am a Nobel laureate that I can use that, that sort of soapbox to be one of the people uh, being a champion uh, for science. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I think we have to uh, make sure for the next generation of scientists that they see that there's going to be a stable funding and stable support for their work because you know bright young people uh, can see different roads ahead of them and they want to obviously go down a road where they think they're going to be able to build a career for mm -hmm. themselves and that they're, they're not just going to uh, live grant to grant. I think it's important that we have both st stable funding and funding that allows people to take chances and to follow uh, their curiosity. Uh, but that links back to what we were just saying a moment ago. That means that you know, society buys the premise, accepts the premise that, that uh, it's, in, it's, it's for the greater good if we have a robust scientific ecosystem and we're bringing at least some of the best and brightest young people into it each year. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree, and and um, yeah, just just educating and and actually motivating young people to to you know take on science, do science. I think that's that's great. And and our last question before the uh, five quick fire questions is is mostly relating to your near term future regarding your research. So maybe can you tell us uh, what what are you currently focusing on um, in in your research, and what will you be focusing on in the near term um, uh, regarding your studies? 
Well, it's 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 obviously more uh, than one thing, but I'll just try to mm. do high, high, highlights. So again, we began working on VHL in 1993, hoping that we could use kidney cancer as sort of a demonstration project and show that if you understood it well enough, not only could you treat it, but eventually you could cure it. So I think mm. we have new treatments for kidney cancer, but we're, we're not routinely curing people with advanced kidney cancer yet. So we're trying to identify other targets in kidney cancers that might uh, then be pursued by the pharmaceutical industry. Mm. The hope being that we could actually get to combination therapies where we have multiple drugs with uh, independent mechanisms of action uh, that can then be combined with one another to try to decrease the problem of resistance. Uh, kidney cancer has historically been known for example, to be a relatively immunogenic tumor. And uh, mm -hmm. there are now some immunotherapy drugs that are useful for the treatment of kidney cancer. And we're trying to understand how that links to the biology of VHL and HIF, because if we can understand that, maybe we can make immunotherapy work uh, even better. Uh, mm -hmm. And then in the interest of time, I'll just mention one other sort of discovery that we're pretty excited about. We mm -hmm. were trying to, we, we were trying, because I think it, it, there's a little lesson here in terms of how science gets done. So. We were using a fairly powerful technique to look for proteins that get secreted by your favorite cell. And so in our case, we were comparing cells that did or did not have the VHL protein. And our, our goal, which was a modest one, was to identify uh, secreted proteins that get, uh, whose secretion is under the control of VHL. Mm -hmm. and the idea being that if you could find such a protein, uh, Maybe it teaches us about the biology of VHL, but maybe it's something that would be convenient to measure in a patient. And you could use this as sort of a surrogate to tell them whether they had tumor cells that lacked the VHL protein. But in the course of using this very powerful technology to look for new secreted proteins, uh, we, we found that one of the histones, namely histone H3, mm -hmm. gets secreted under certain conditions. And that sort of surprised us. It turns out it has nothing to do with VHL. In fact, histone H3 was one of the controls in our experiment since we were sure it would not be secreted. But in fact, we wound, wound up finding histone H3 being secreted and not the other histones. And to make a long story short, that of course begged the question, why would cells secrete mm -hmm. one of their histones? We found out that this, the secreted histone has certain chemical marks that are distinctive compared to the histone that's inside the cell as though there's a message being sent and we were even able to show that that secreted histone can then be taken up by other cells and enter the nucleus of a recipient cell and get integrated into the chromatin of the recipient cells. So we think this might be a uh, possibly ancient form of cellular uh, communication. Mm -hmm. And we've also done proof of concept experiments that this can be harnessed to then deliver your favorite protein across the cell membrane if you fuse it to the histone H3. So mm -hmm. this is one of the things we're excited about today. Yeah, very, very exciting research and, and good luck um, with the research. And, and our last five quick fire questions. So short questions, short answers. The first one is who is your role model if you have one? Uh, my role model was uh, my mentor, David uh, Livingston, who sadly died. Uh, about a month ago, but uh, he was my role model as a scientist. Hmm. What was the best advice you were ever given? You know, the best advice I, I was ever given, I actually gave myself. Uh, and, <laughs> and that is when I was in college trying to decide what to study, I, mm -hmm. I thought the best things to study on balance would be the things that teach you how to think clearly because I didn't know exactly what I was going to wind up doing, but I knew whatever I would wind up doing, knowing how to think logically and clearly would be very helpful. So I'm glad I sort of loaded up on classes in mathematics and computer science and philosophy. Mm -hmm. I figured mm -hmm. any of the courses that involved a lot of rote memorization, I could always go back and memorize it some other day. Mm -hmm. The most important skill or maybe lesson you learned as a researcher? Uh, I think it sort of relates a little bit to the last question, but I think mm -hmm. another thing that I learned from the scientists I admire is just the importance of 
of having a nose for good questions, having what I sometimes call, call scientific instincts. Uh, mm -hmm. That that real you know good experiments start with a good question, and and people get mm -hmm. overly preoccupied with the, these wonderful shiny technologies that you can use these days as a scientist. But in my view, every good scientific experiment starts with a good question, and then, then you figure out what technologies you need to answer the question. Mm -hmm. And and is that the advice you would give for for young scientists if you have to give one advice or or something else? Uh, yes, I, I would say don't get, I mean, the, I, I thought learning the techniques of science would be the hardest part of science, and it turns out to be the easiest. So if you have mm -hmm. the right people, I've, I've never seen a technique that if properly explained by the right person, I couldn't understand how to do the technique. Uh, the more valuable thing is learning how to think like a scientist, again, picking good questions, mm -hmm. and then thinking logically, designing powerful experiments with the right controls that really will then mm -hmm. answer those questions. That, that's that's what distinguishes uh, great scientists from people who are frankly just technicians. Mm -hmm. Great, and the last one, I know you were born in New York, so I know you're working at Harvard, so I have to ask Boston or New York. Well, I think it, that's sort of apples to oranges. It's like you know, Monet, <laughs> Monet or Rembrandt, but of course I'm gonna say Boston. <laughs> Dr. Kalin, thank you very much uh, for the interview. It was, it was a great pleasure. Great, thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, Marlena, thanks.